title of our presentation today is MG Across Generations. MG, as you know, affects people of all ages. But how does age affect MG? I'd like to introduce our panel members. Um, first, Dr. Wayne Rubenstein. Is, he's been a great supporter for our organization. He's a member of our medical advisory board. He's a neurologist who focuses on clinical care. So he has a real day-to-day -day understanding of treating MG and the kind of issues that we encounter. Peggy Cashman, on the other end, um, she represents our retiree perspective. She was diagnosed in her 40s, had a thymectomy, and um, then almost fully recovered from MG. Her MG then flared a little bit later with another health issue. Mitchell Rhodes is a retired doctor. He was driving on an expressway in 2007 when he first noticed MG vision symptoms, so imagine that. Rilla Parker is my good friend, and she's traveled over 100 miles to get here today, so I appreciate that. She's a nurse, a pastor's wife, mom to three boys, um, picture athletic scholarships, uh, an avid runner, and, and a coach. She, died, she was diagnosed with MG in her 40s, uh, but may have had symptoms as early as her 20s. Holly Cost, our last person on the panel, was running a big school carnival when MG hit in 2007. A thymectomy eliminated um, her vision and speech problems, and she's back to a full schedule. Three of our panelists have had thymectomies, and so I wanted to address that. I believe that um, they had them in their 30s or 40s. And I'm going to turn to Dr. Rubenstein. Um, is that uh, is that one of the few treatments for MG that seems to be age-related? Not necessarily age-related, but something that um, is best accomplished as early in the course of the disease as possible. Um, so for a uh, younger person, uh, presenting with myasthenic symptoms. Uh, thymectomy is an important weapon in your arsenal to affect a, a, a long-term improvement in clinical course. So if you do a thymectomy early in the course of the disease, your chances of having less symptoms a decade, two decades in the future are, are much greater. Um, as individuals present um, in middle age, um, uh, however we define middle age. I'm not sure, but, um, uh, so we, we worry about uh, actual uh, cancer of the thymus gland, and so thymectomy takes a little bit of a different role. Uh, but in the, in the older age group, um, where there are often other medical problems, sometimes uh, thymectomy uh, is too much to have somebody go through. Uh, so sometimes it doesn't get done in older age groups. And uh, if there's no demonstrable pathology of the thymus, the, the benefits of it are, are questioned. So part of the international thymectomy trial is to help define uh, the responses at different age groups and uh, the exact statistics about how many people respond and how long it takes. Uh, both Peggy and Rilla have managed uh, treatment of more than one illness. Peggy, could you tell us about how your other illness, about your other illness and how it affected your MG? Uh, in 2001, I had brain surgery, removal of a benign meningioma. Um, we, I was given higher doses of prednisone, which exacerbated my MG. I'm a nurse, and I was stuck with a dirty needle over 20 years ago. And at that time, um, exhibited symptoms and experienced uh, a disease called cytomegalovirus. The problem with the, that virus is if I am immunosuppressed, which we must do for the MG to control the symptoms, then it allows the virus to reactivate. While others have had to redefine usual. Um, Holly, where are you at with this? I have to say I'm pretty much life as usual mm -hmm. right now. I mean, I'm 49. Um, at some point, things might change, but I'm involved in the PTA, I'm playing tennis three or four times a week, I, I've gone off a couple of, I'm one of those people that always says yes, 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 so I've said no to some things to try to find time for myself every day to kind of de-stress, but in, I'm not taking any medicine right now, so I think it's a good thing, and I mean, I'm sure at some point I need to be aware that this can flare up anytime you have something else, it can have to watch for it, but I, I think it's good right now. 
Mitchell, how does that, how does, to what degree have you been able to get back to usual? Uh, Hubble Vision that started three years ago is still there. Sometimes when I get up in the morning, the two images are pretty close together. But over the next hour, they sort of separate horizontally and vertically. If my husband had two wives, he could really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm currently on the prednisone 20 every other day and cell uh twice a day with the hope of being able to taper the prednisone. I had a uh, problem with osteoporosis and a, a partially collapsed thoracic vertebrae about a year after starting the prednisone, even though it wasn't. A, terribly high dose, so my neurologist started the cell set with the hope of tapering the prednisone. I have good days and bad days. Yesterday, I was very weak, very tired. This morning, got up and did an hour's worth of exercise and look forward to coming over here. So it varies. Sometimes, well, if we're downtown, we can walk five, six miles, but not in one fell swoop. We'll stop at Macy's and Nordstrom's and <laughs> over the course of the, the day, people have walked five or six miles. One of the issues that I don't see in print very often is cramps, but I've experienced the heck out of those. So I could, and, and other people in support groups that I've heard have as well. Yeah, so cramps are very common. Uh, they occur as a result um, of instability at, at the neuromuscular junction. So the muscle is firing when it's not supposed to be firing. Um, uh, anything that destabilizes the neuromuscular junction will make cramps more likely. So if you have neuropathy, um, in addition to having myasthenia gravis, cramps can be particularly troubling. And what would that be? Um, a neuropathy, uh, for example, commonly in diabetes, where there's loss of, of uh, distal nerve function, so numbness and tingling in the extremities. Um, uh, when you're uh, deficient or have relatively low levels of potassium or of calcium, you're particularly susceptible to cramps. Um, and many patients are able to overcome that by um, taking some additional calcium and potassium. So the bananas and milk before you go to bed kind of prescription to reduce cramps is very helpful. Um, and there's, now sometimes there's <coughs> cramping that you, that you want to pay attention to because it's a problem, right? Uh, over too much medication. Right, so if you're also um, on mestinon, which most people take less of at night, uh, cramps become uh, more of a problem. Uh, so uh, for most people, cramps occur occasionally. Um, they, you really don't have to do too much. If cramps occur on a regular basis at night, um, you should look at the timing of your medication and try and adjust that. Um, you should, if you're on prednisone, you should be taking calcium supplementation, so it's a good idea to maybe take that at night unless you're going to forget to take it, in which case you should probably take it in the morning. Um, and then adding some potassium-containing uh, foods is usually helpful and, and usually not a problem unless you have anything wrong with your kidneys, and then you need to carefully watch how much potassium you're adding. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.